So um, thank you so much for coming to this session. I'm really honored and pleased that you're all here. Thanks for coming to Drizzly, New York City. Uh, any, how many people are local to New York City? Lots of locals? Oh, that's great. Um, who traveled the farthest? I'm from Boston. That's not that far. I know Dan From where? Florida. Florida. I know Daniel's here from Portugal. <laughs> where? Joplin, Missouri? German. Oh, German. You're old. <laughs> Have, I still think Daniel from Portugal is, is the winner. But anyway, well, welcome, welcome. <laughs> nice to see everybody here. <laughs> anyway, so um, again, thanks for coming to this session. So what we're going to do in this session is we're going to send our apps back to school. So who here spent the first part of this month getting their kids ready to go back to school? This is September. Your kids are getting ready. How about you yourself? Who went back to school? I just finished 11 weeks with Coursera doing machine learning with Andrew Ng. So this is really, really, <laughs> I'm so grateful that's over. That was absolutely dreadful. Uh, but I learned a lot, but it was really hard. Uh, well, I just want you to think about the kind of the joy and the anticipation. Oh, thank you. Um, the joy and, and the anticipation of this time of year, of September. It's a time for new beginnings. It's a time to learn, learn new things. And uh, I hope that we'll, uh, we'll take some of this love of learning and this joyfulness of going back to school and apply it to our mobile apps. Mobile apps are already fun enough. And we're going to make them even more fun in this talk. So, OK, so we're going to go ahead and learn three funky strategies to make your native script apps just a little bit smarter. So who am I? That's me. That is actually my first grade picture with that, uh, remember Peggy Fleming, the ice skater? <laughs> you can tell it's 1976 because I have my Snoopy pin. That was the bicentennial. It was a big, big deal. Um, you probably literally no one here <laughs> remembers this, but yes, um, polyester for the win in the 70s. It was awesome. But my name's Jen Looper. I'm a senior developer advocate here at Progress, and you can find me on Twitter where I'm usually hanging out, or a lot of people will find me on Slack, where I'm also almost always online hanging out to answer questions and to help people. So who wakes up in the middle of the night with cold sweats thinking, oh, my apps, they're boring, they're stupid, they're gray, and they're ugly. I can't really help you with the gray, ugly parts. But um, if you ever have this feeling that your apps are just doing this one thing, they don't have any interesting integrations, you know, they might need a little bit of help from some of the new strategies we can offer, then uh, maybe this is the talk for you. So if you are tired of stupid, boring apps, get suited up. So it's back to school time for your apps. And today's curriculum, we're going to learn three things. We're going to take a technique to make your app just a little bit more sensitive. I'm going to give you a technique on how to turn your app into a personal assistant with one plugin. And then we're going to take a look at two machine learning APIs that um, are really, really fun and worth a try. So we're going to go ahead and do that in this talk. Come on in. So let's talk about this concept of making your app smarter. I know the word smart is kind of thrown around a lot. And it's, it can be kind of an annoying word, because it's not like we're going to raise your app's IQ or raise a child's IQ. We're going to actually make our apps a little more human-like. For me, making something smarter is raising its emotional, the EQ, the emotional push. You know, make them a little bit more human-like, a, a little bit more empathetic, a little bit more like us. So I want to introduce to you an app that I've been working on for a little while. It's called QuickNoms, and it's a smart recipe app. And to be perfectly honest, all that it was before I started tweaking it for this talk is a basic master detail screen. So it's a card layout with some categories of recipes. You have um, you know, meat recipes and snacks, soups and salads, vegetarian recipes. And then I give a card layout of those recipes. You click into it, and you can view the recipe uh, by ingredient. You can look at the tools used to make it, and then it'll give you the procedure. So the back of the backstory of Quick Noms is that I just sent my oldest daughter off to college. She's at UBC. And I, I, her senior year, I just realized, my god, this child, she does not know how to cook. <laughs> she does not know how to cook is really a crisis. So instead of actually you know, teaching her how to cook, I built her an app. So I, I built Quick Noms for, for her and for all the children of the world who have no idea what they're doing in the kitchen. <laughs> so the bottom line is with five ingredients, um, just a, maybe 15 minutes worth of prep time, minimal setup, we have recipes for all. So if you have a frying pan, a little bit of oil, a wooden spoon, and a couple of eggs, you can get dinner on the table. Thank you, Jesus. We are all set. So no more starvation for the children. Um, this app is powered by Firebase. Um, terrific 
back end as a service. Probably I should flip it to Convey after this talk. We'll, uh, we'll take a look at how to do that. Um, but there's a couple of cool Firebase uh, bits that I use. Oh, I really jumped the gun, sorry. Come on in, we'll learn about quick noms. <laughs> A uh, couple of interesting Firebase pieces that I it did integrate from the beginning. Uh, this yellow bar at the top is using um, remote config. So it looks, a, oops, like, sorry. So if I would uh, input a new recipe on the web, on your mobile device, I can also add a little note saying, look, there's something new. Um, so it was, it was modeled after the UI and the interaction that an, um, an app called Forks Over Knives uses. I don't know if you've run into Forks Over Knives. This probably looks familiar. It's a vegetarian app. Uh, it's very, very nice, but it has a lot of nice notifications and a really good layout. So this is a, a great way to see how you can flip this sort of app. QuickNoms also has a website, quicknoms.com. You can uh, input your recipes, uh, and I would encourage you to go ahead and submit your recipes, five ingredients, 15 minutes, uh, and, and very few um, bits and pieces that you need to integrate. So I was in New Orleans, and of course I was thinking, oh, maybe we should get a gumbo recipe. Well, I tried to make gumbo. That is not a quick knob. <laughs> that is really, really tricky. But, you know, for things like avocado toast, we're, we're money ahead with quick knobs. So here's a little um, detailing of some of the cool uh, bits and pieces that are integrated into this app as it stands today. Like I said, I use remote config for this kind of marquee at the top. I also incorporated the Algolia search plugin. Anybody tried to use the Algolia search plugin? Very nice plugin. Another community um, member did this, guy in India, and you're basically creating a collection in, in, in Algolia, and then your app can very, very quickly and efficiently search, and it's looking in all of the pieces of your app. It's looking at the title, it's looking at all of the, um, all of the text, so it's just doing a really solid, fast text search. So Algolia plugin I strongly recommend. And I also integrated the text-to-speech plugin, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but that's a really awesome way to enhance um, your app. So that's all part of the mobile app. So you input your recipes on the web, and you um, use them on mobile. So the goal, like I said, make our apps a little bit more human, make them a little bit more empathetic. What can we do with this basic, uh, somewhat vanilla, master detail card layout and make it intuitive? So the first thing I wanted to try was to make my app a little bit more sensitive. And to do that, I thought, well, what if I'm you know, wandering through my house completely uninspired, and um, I'm just feeling, you know, it's just really toasty in here. I'm just looking for a recipe to cool down. You know, maybe maybe uh, I can have my app suggest something to me that would make me feel better. So I integrated this, which is a particle photon, and it's, it's actually, at this moment, reading the temperature of this room and posting data to the cloud. So I'm going to show you how I built this, and we'll talk a little bit about how to integrate a sensor into your app. So this is the first strategy to make your app a little bit more empathetic. So like I said, we're going to add a sensor integration. I always, my go-to sensor, my go-to microprocessor in general is the particle photon. Uh, you can also use the electron, which is another product by particle. They, uh, we have someone who is a power user of this device, and we love them. <laughs> Anybody else tried this microprocessor? They're terrific. I just love them because they're Wi-Fi enabled, and they have a whole cloud that comes with it. So you can have a nice mobile app that you can control. Uh, it, it really works beautifully. This, this one is one without pins. You can buy them this way so that you could solder it directly to some device. Or I have mine pinned right into a mini breadboard. So you need to build your device, grab your particle photon, Go to the hardware store and grab a little ten temperature sensor. And after about 25 bucks, a couple of wires, a mini breadboard, a microprocessor, and a temperature sensor, and you're going to have your device pinned out. Really, really easy. So a um, really fun little exercise. Kids can do it. The next thing you need to do is to flash your code to the photon. So since this is a Wi-Fi enabled device, you can flash code right onto the device. And for me, I've done a pin out so that it's looking at uh, the pin uh, A5, and it's getting the sensor is sensing from pin A5 what temperature it is. And I have the ability to switch it from Celsius to Fahrenheit according to how you would like. Right now, it's just pushing Fahrenheit temperatures every 10 seconds into the cloud. So very easy. Just a couple lines of code. And 
we are pushing data every 10 seconds into the particle cloud, but I can't grab data directly out of the particle cloud and push it into my app. I needed to do one more integration, which actually kind of annoyed me, but oh well, learn, learn, learn something new. So I used another little thing that the particle cloud offers, which is webhook. So uh, this is living in the particle clouds, watching for data written by your device into the cloud, taking that data and posting it into Firebase. So you can see it's going straight to my temperatures collection in my, um, in my Firebase um, app. Since I'm already using Firebase, may as well just keep, keep using it, push the data in there, and then consume it. So Webhook is going to be writing data to the Firebase. It's going to get the date. It's going to tell which device it's looking at and what temperature the room is. Now, I did make a mistake, which I'm sure more experienced people have noticed. This is a really small breadboard, and the device gets a little toasty. So the temperature is picking up, you know, actually, not so much the room temperature, but the device temperature, but that's okay. Anyway, so um, the nice lady gave me some ice, so we're going to see this uh, working a little bit in the app. So the app is consuming data, and it's reacting to it. And after a button press, it's going to suggest recipes to you, hot recipes or cold recipes. If it's hotter than hail inside the house, maybe you want a nice shake or some ice cream or something like that. And here is a recipe just for you. So it's a little suggestion engine. So to do this in your native script app, you're going to set up, and I always tend to use Angular, so I went ahead and leveraged um, observables within my Angular app. I ask my recipe service to get me some temperatures, passing in the device ID, so it's taking a look at which device is posting what to Firebase. Then I'm subscribing within this collection to the temperatures that are coming back. So observables are great for this sort of things because it's just you know refreshing and refreshing and refreshing. So we'll see it work in a second. And uh, I decided that if the temperature is above 70, then I'll suggest some recipes to cool down. And if it's under 70, then I'll suggest things that are a little toasty. Now, you may be thinking, um, well, that's very cute, Jen, but um, I don't want to actually ask all of my app users to do a pin out <laughs> and do, you know, create a device. Well, um, just because I'm hooked on hardware doesn't mean everybody else is, but maybe your uh, house is not as stupid as my house is and you might have a nest. So it can test for the temperature in each room, and with an API call, you know, you can get that temperature and, and integrate this information into your app. Um, I, my house is from 1929, and some of the electrical is also from 1929, so I'm not, I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> so we'll just leave that be for all of you technological people who want to spoof, you know, boost up your, your house. You might have a Nest integrated, and there's a great API to use. But for my purposes, I just put my little microprocessor, mi microprocessor in the kitchen, and it picks up the temperature. So let's do a little demo. All righty. And here we are. Can you see it? Okay. Um, so my device is actually hooked into, it's getting, um, it's getting a Wi-Fi signal off of my phone. So that's the blue bar. So just ignore that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my handy dandy side drawer to take a look at what temperatures are being read in. So right now it says it's 73 degrees in here. I don't know if that feels right to you. I'm going to put my finger on the temperature sensor and see if I can make it a little warmer. are probably cold. <laughs> All right. Let's see if let's see if we can cool it down. I wish we short the whole thing out. Put some ice on it. There it goes, down to 62. All right, before it gets hot again, find me some recipes. Find me some recipes. Oh, egg muffin, how delicious. Watch me like short out this whole device with this water. So, put the ice away, John. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, and it'll warm up. 68. Every 10 seconds, it's just getting a new temperature. 75. And recipes to make you a little cooler, so nice ice cream, or nice salad if you're actually trying to eat healthy. So there we go. One strategy, use a little microprocessor, or integrate to your nest. Okay. Another strategy would be to leverage our brand new plugin marketplace, which you just saw demoed in the, um, in the keynote. 
you can go ahead and use many different plugins, but some of them are really great to kind of humanize your app. And the plugin that I used, which I mentioned, to make my app into basically a personal assistant when I'm sitting in the kitchen and I'm trying to cook and my hands are all covered with chocolate and I don't want to hit my iPhone <laughs> with my chocolatey fingers. So I went ahead and, um, and incorporated the text-to-speech plugin. Very, very easy to use this. You just integrate the plugin and uh, it will, you pass it a string and it'll just speak out the text to you according to how your, um, how your phone does this sort of natural speech processing. So um, this is very, very easy to demo. Again, let's see how Siri sounds with a recipe. OK, who wants some ribs? <laughs> Foil, paper t more time. Foil, paper towel, pan for oven. It's actually not that bad, and it works really, really well. And there's just like just a few lines of code and a great plugin. It's it's a it's a really nice thing. Let's see if I can find something short. To my friend Jay sent in bachelor sushi. In a small bowl, use the fork to mix the tuna, mayonnaise, and sriracha sauce. Sprinkle a little rice vinegar over the rice. Add the meat on top of the flavored rice. Literally. <laughs> Siri's calling me to tell me to shut up, okay. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, okay. Anyway, so, text-to-speech. But what I really want to talk about, actually, and this is a really fun piece of this demo, is that you can add machine learning today to your apps. and. Um, and I also had a great time choosing some of these images. Um, there are lots of ladies in miniskirts with large computers on the internet. So <laughs> apparently, you know, back in the day, you couldn't work on a computer without having a really short skirt. But that's the way it went. So let's talk about machine learning. Anybody, I, I went through the Coursera course with Andrew Ng. Anybody pass this course? <laughs> Working on it? Hoy, it's, it's a lot, yes. So um, as we know, machine learning is very easy. Not, it's actually, <laughs> is actually kind of a nightmare, um, especially if you're a French major like me and you look at these things and you just sort of die inside. Um, well, thank God, we have some awesome companies, one of whom is in New York City, Clarify. Any people from Clarify? Who knows Clarify? Fabulous, fabulous New York City company. We love them, I love them to death. Um, well, they have offered us the ability to use machine learning in our apps by using their pre-trained models. So Clarify has some examples and then um, Google Cloud Platform, of course, has many more. So let's take a look at integrating Clarify and the Google, Google Cloud Platform. So what does Clarify offer us in terms of integrating machine learning uh, into our apps? Well, they are the specialists, I would say, in image analysis. Even, it's very interesting because they've been fighting off being acquired by Facebook and Google. Their um, founder is some kind of guy. So much, much love to Clarify. They took not, they weren't like fifth place in the 2013 ImageNet Challenge. They took all five top awards in the ImageNet Challenge um, of 2013. So every year they do an ImageNet Challenge to see who can uh, process images best. And uh, Clarify crushes them every time and I love it. It's wonderful. So uh, they offer real innovative techniques in training models to analyze images. They do all sorts of interesting things, tweaking the, um, the vectors to, to see how to, how to classify images. And for our intents and purposes, they offer a beautiful APIs that we can use now. Um, and they have pre-trained models that are extremely useful for my purposes because they have a food model. So um, they're looking for things like if you see um, a field of greens, well, they're gonna say it's probably either a field of kale or, or arugula, it's not somebody's lawn. You know? So they're looking for food type data to come through. They also have wedding models and SFW models, uh, a lot of great stuff that you can use nowadays. They're actually also offering you the ability to train your own model, which is, uh, which is a really interesting thing. So the business case that I dreamed up is that I would be in a restaurant and have a great meal and think, maybe I could recreate this in my own kitchen, but it may or may not be a quick nom. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a picture and have these machine learning algorithms analyze whether it might be a quick nom or not. And the way I'm asking it to do is I'm asking it to send me back tags at a certain level of certainty. And if there are a certain number of tags with a certain level of certainty that these are ingredients that I recognize, that's probably a quick nom because quick noms tend to be um, easily discernible parts. You know, that's definitely a strawberry, a grape, a piece of mint, 
and uh, blueberry. This it looks delicious, but uh, probably not. I can't, I can't discern the ingredients. It's probably not a quick note. So the way I built this into my NativeScript app is I take a photo, use the camera module, take a photo, and then send it to Clarify. I use the REST API with Clarify, pass it my auth key, and I send my image as base64 image, and it's gonna send me back some tags. So here's the result that comes back, and I start to sift through the tags and do my own little business logic analysis here. So if the ingredients length, the, the tags that come back, are, are of a certain level of certainty, 0.899 and above, uh, then if there are more than four or less than eight, I'm gonna say it's probably uh, qualifies as a quick nom. So let's just see how this is gonna work. So I have some mapo dofu and my, all right, here we go. All right, so back to my model. Actually, I can yank this out. Okay, so quick number not. Take a picture. Let's see what comes back. Aha, well, th it thinks it might be a quick nom, so. Because it came back with uh, a bunch of tofu, vegetables, uh, and some other good things. So, let's try this one. See what tags come back. Definitely might qualify as a quick nom strawberry, sweet, berry, mint, cream, fruit salad, that sort of thing. I have a feeling I, I, I recently tweaked my business logic and it may not be 100%, but you get the idea. Grab your tags back, let the machine learning algorithm go to work for you, and then analyze using your own uh, logic. So that is how Clarify works. All right. Well, what if I have another use case and I'm wandering around in the grocery store and I see some interesting produce that happens to be here at my podium? <laughs> and I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm so uninspired. I'm literally so uninspired. So how, how can I, you know, maybe I, how can I use this in my recipes? How can I use this to create a quick nom? So let's see what happens if I use the same strategy of taking a picture and running it through uh, the Google Vision API. Well, before I do this demo, I just want to mention that with Google Cloud Platform, you can use their Vision API and you can do it all. So it's not like they're pre-training models, food models like Clarify does. They have all of the Google imagery that you've been feeding it for so many years at hand and they've been analyzing the heck out of it. So um, <laughs> thanks, Google. Uh, they're leveraging their consumption of millions of photos and they're getting all that metadata back. So very, very powerful. Uh, amount of stuff they can do with images. They can get, grab you the labels or look for explicit content. They can find logos. They um, can detect whether it's the Golden Gate Bridge or that bridge in Portugal that looks exactly the same. Uh, face detection, is it a face? Is it NativeScript cat? <laughs> um, image attributes, all the different tags and metadata and everything that can come back from uh, images. Uh, and I kind of like this one, I want to try this one. Web detection, you take a picture and it'll find where this sort of thing is mentioned um, elsewhere on the internet. So that'd be great for like a large recipe search, I think. So take a picture just like I did last time. Send it to Google using the API. So I send my key through, I send my image again as base64, and then I tell Google I want specifically the label detection from your API. So, and I only want the first result that comes back. So, at, after that point we grab the first label and then, wow, I already have Algolia search already integrated into my app. That's really convenient because I can just take that label and see what recipes I already have that would qualify uh, with using these ingredients. All right, let's try it. Let's see what crazy things happen. All right, I will show you my screen. Okay, so this is called ingredient search. So I'm in a grocery store. Come on, Algolia. Oh, it couldn't find anything with my arm. All right, let's try that one. Let's try, that one. <laughs> let's try an apple. 
Uh, let's try it on a blank background without my arm. Searching for arm. Yes, there are no recipes with arms in quick noms. All right, here we go. If apple pie doesn't come back, I'm going to be angry. Jewelry. <laughs> It does? Really? Okay. All right, it's probably going to come back with ham. Let's see. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> this is actually how I make pies and applesauce. So, it's a pretty good recipe. Oh, whew, okay. <laughs> All right. All right, no more fun and games. Now we're going to look forward to the future. We went very, way back into the past, into 1976, with the incredible clothing styles. Well, now I'd like to look forward into the future. What are, what are some things that we can look forward to in terms of integrating machine learning algorithms into our apps? Well, one thing that's, that's today, what's happening today, is that you can do machine learning on device. So previously, I was just showing, you know, making basic API calls to a service and getting back, you know, interesting data from random images. Well, uh, now we're able to do machine learning right on our device, which is really, really exciting, um, because you might not want to make a bunch of REST API calls. Um, Google Cloud Vision, all, a lot of the Google Cloud stuff starts to really add up, and you'll get hit by a nasty bill once your app gets, you know, those million downloads come down. So that can be dicey. Same with Clarify. They're going to, you know, they got to make money one way or another. If you need offline capability. You know, you might want to uh, avoid these kind of REST API calls, which is, you know, asking for the internet to send you back things. Again, reducing costs, a API calls can add up. Or if you want to train something really custom that is definitely not going to say hand and jewelry, you know, when you're taking pictures of apples and oranges. So um, if you want to train something really custom, you could do that, you know, on your local computer, build up your model locally, and then use it uh, and, and have it be processed on device. So, just landed in uh, iOS 11. I do not know why they did not make a bigger deal out of this. I'm, I'm sitting here in my kitchen, like, screaming, talk about Core ML at the, at the Apple event, and it was all ARKit. Well, I, forget ARKit. Core ML is the next big thing, OK? So if you're an iOS developer and you love to deal with machine learning, Core ML is going to allow you to take your models and process them right in your app. So uh, this is a really exciting thing. I can't wait to try it. But an even more exciting thing, and this gets me up in the morning and get me to bed at night, is uh, using TensorFlow. How many TensorFlow users here? It's not the easiest thing in the world to learn. Uh, even the installation is kind of a nasty mess. But um, there is a new library that was announced at Google I.O., which is kind of like a reduced part of TensorFlow. It's called TensorFlow Mobile. And we are able to, to learn on our device, not only for iOS, but also for Android. So, Core ML is great for iOS, but it's never going to be cross-platform. TensorFlow, once it gets more mature and you can start using it on device, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. I'm really excited to see this come. And you can use uh, this sort of training on device right now using Google Translate. I don't know if you've run into this before, but you can go ahead. Let me see if I can shrink my screen a little bit. And you can use the various models. So what you say is, I want to start translating from German to English. So I'm invited to import the model, and it's kind of a big chunk of you know, data, but you're going to import your model, and then you can start using it using your camera. So for some languages, this is already happening. So if you can see, this is a you know, basic you know, um, German website, but you start align your text, and it's being translated in real time. Wow. Right? Land grabbing. Wiedervernassen. What is it? It means uh, readmission. I don't know. My German is terrible. However, when I am in Bulgaria in November and I'm on that freaking subway and trying to figure out what those signs mean, I'm going to have this working. So I'm so excited about Google Translate. This is, this is, this is really, really great to see. Uh, and the other demo I just wanted to show you is um, an app that you can download and um, launch within Xcode today. And it is TensorFlow on device. And it's so primitive that they haven't even got their icons sorted out. But it's basically. Cash machine. Cash machine. Your cash machine? T TJ. <laughs> Library. Library. <laughs> so 
there's something about this model that's, um, I think it's been trained on a room or something. <laughs> uh, sliding door, window shade. Okay, window shade, right? Thank you, TensorFlow. <laughs> okay. And I think, <laughs> that's okay. It told me that native script cat was a um, French bulldog. <laughs> she was so mad. So, um, yeah, I don't know about how it does with people. I don't think it's, oh, a groom. You're getting married soon? <laughs> okay. Anyway, so. Uh, and then you can freeze frame. I think that these sort of things, toilet tissue? I think that these sort of things are great for um, uh, disabled people. I think that's what they're designed for. Um, Microsoft has a much better integration that you can download and it's in production. But for, um, you know, if you need to go through a room and you don't really know what you're looking at, then these apps can help with that sort of thing by reading out loud what it's seeing. This is all being done on device via a model that's imported. So that is what I wanted to show you for today. And uh, thank you for a groovy time. And uh, hit me up on Twitter, and I'm happy. I don't know what kind of time we've got, but I think we have a few minutes for questions, if you have any questions. Yeah? How large are the models that you have to import? Several megs, yeah. And um, there's some good tutorials now on how to compress your models. It's really critical to get the compression right, I think. Um, so I think, and it's interesting because it's kind of nice in the Google Translate app, it'll give you a list of what you've imported and it'll tell you the size so you can kind of manage the, um, the consumption of, of your data. Yeah, this is something that um, is always gonna be, I think, an issue. So, yeah. What's the Algolia search? What is that? What was it again, sorry? Algolia search. Oh, Algolia search? Uh, Algolia is uh, fabulously competing with Google for search. Um, and they have, we have a nice native script plugin that you can use. So you just, um, like, I basically import the data from my app. And I did it manually, but there's other ways to do it. So I took all of my text out of Firebase and I stuffed it into Algolia. And then it's searching and sending me back really quickly. So I don't remember, like, log in. I don't remember my sign in, but it's been a while. But um, very uh, excellent way to integrate search. And we have this nice plugin. Does that have Firebase integration? Or do you I did it manually, but I think we could probably do it via a cloud function on Firebase to have it pushed. I have a little script running locally on my computer, and I can just hit it, and it'll push data. And the trick with Firebase cloud functions is that since it's hitting an external API, they're going to make you pay for it. And I don't like to pay for anything. So. It's a problem. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. It was really fun. <laughs>